whether you're in an urban environment or a rural environment, how does the world around you affect the way you make music? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say yes and no. I feel like I could still make washed out music like uh, anywhere, um, whether that's like in the back of a tour bus or uh, in the middle of a city or, you know, like where I'm at now you know, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But I do think it can sort of subconsciously maybe seep into the material. Um, I try not to overthink it. And actually at this point, like having made music for, you know, something like 20 years, it very much is like this sort of flow state. You know, when I sit down and start working, you know, I know enough of the technical side of things where I don't even have to really actively think about it. So it just sort of naturally happens. But um, I think the move mainly had to do with just like my lifestyle and, um, you know, what I was looking for at this point in my life, um, which I'm pretty much like a homebody type and quite private. So um, the idea of having 20 acres to myself was, was uh, made a lot of sense. Um, what do you have on the, I know it says horse farm, but what, what's, what's your setup like? I, I, I'm from Missouri. Um, I grew up around farms and horses and stuff. What's, what's your setup? What kind of animals do you have? Do you have a pond? Like, like, sure. Set the scene. Yeah. It's certainly not a farm. There's, there's not any kind of, uh, livestock or anything. Um, basically it was a functioning horse farm. Let's see, probably in the 40s and 50s i guess maybe some in the 60s but the the house was built uh in the 60s and then uh, about 20 years later they after at that point the the horse farm wasn't really there there's still a huge barn here um but they sort of transitioned they built like a really big pond and then they built a cabin where i'm sitting right now which i've kind of turned into my studio zone so it doesn't look, you know, the large pasture where the horses were is now the pond mainly. Uh, there's still some green space around. Uh, there's still some trails and stuff around. Um, but it doesn't really look and feel much like a farm or anything. But um, the way it's laid out is is really nice, though. They did a really good job. The house sits up on a hill, which has a great view of the open green space in the pond. And then the cabin where I am now is kind of on the opposite side. So it's super private and um, like I said, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So you never see anyone, there's no neighbors or anything. Um, Going yeah. back to making music for 20 years, like, can you take us back to the MySpace days? Oh, MySpace. wow. Yeah, we can time travel to um, to MySpace. Your yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I kind of um, was discovered through MySpace, mainly through, uh, I forget what it was called, but you know, on, on your MySpace page, you had like, you could showcase like your top friends or something. It's like, mm -hmm. like maybe eight slots that you could put in there. Um, and uh, top eight was a big deal. Top eight was a big deal. Yeah, top eight. Yeah, it was a big deal to flex. You know, a little bit of um, who is your friend or whatnot. And you know, my only friend at the time that was you know, quote unquote, in the music business was. Uh, this guy Chaz uh, Bear, who uh, writes music, is Tori Moi, and uh, he's you know become quite popular. Um, but at the time, neither both of us were in college, and um, you know just made music as a hobby mainly. Um, but it was through his, he had me as a top friend, and then some A and R person kind of stumbled upon my page through that, and I had probably something like fifty friends on MySpace, um, and wasn't actively like pitching my music or anything. It was just something I did for myself and I shared with like a handful of friends. Never played shows or anything. Um, basically, I went to college and got my first laptop and like sort of discovered, you know, making music on a computer. You know, I played in bands when I was in high school. Um, but the fact that I could kind of do everything on my own, you know, with multi-tracking and you know, modern software, recording software, um, that's pretty easy to do. So um, from that point on, it was just kind of, I went down that lane and was doing everything myself. And um, yeah, I got discovered on MySpace and uh, yeah, the rest is history, I guess. Shout out Tom from MySpace. 
What's that? Shout out Tom from MySpace. Yeah, shout out Tom. Yeah. You know, what, what, what old Tom is up to these days? I'm sure he's got a nice house somewhere on a beach somewhere. Uh, um, now, Ernest, you went you went to UGA, and UGA is famous for B52s and REM, and you know this great music tradition. Um, when you were there, obviously different era, but was that a bustling creative space to create music that the university? It was. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure to some degree it's like most universities in that, you know, it's this young group of people sort of figuring themselves out and having a lot of free time. Um, and so, yeah, I'm sure that happens to some degree on most college campuses, but yeah, Athens is, is sort of a unique place, uh, you know, in Georgia, you know, things have changed, you know, in the last, uh, few years, you know, like there's been an influx of a lot of people from other areas of the country. And it's, I would say like more diverse politically, you know, but when I was, um, coming up, you know, Georgia was like very much a red state. And then Athens was this small little, uh, blue zone, you know, like not much, uh, not much blue voting outside of there. And so with that, you know, it's just like a little bit more open-minded, particularly in terms of the arts. Um, but yeah, Athens has always had like a great music scene and there's a lot of great small venues um, that, you know, you can, you know, sell out. There's a couple I can think of that, you know, max capacity is like around a hundred people or something. So yeah. um, it's, it's definitely a good spot to uh, kind of figure things out. Uh, it's very cheap to live there uh, and still is. Um, so, yeah, it was great. I, I had a lot of friends in bands, but I didn't really play, perform very much until after my time there. So were you, were you, you were never in a band? You never, like, played bass for 10 minutes in, like, a rock band or anything like that? Or I did in high school. That was more like garage band, you know, like, literally playing in my garage uh, with friends. Um, Some Green Day and, covers. Uh, yeah yeah for sure um yeah i i learned the guitar through like yeah that era green day and nirvana and stuff like that um but yeah i didn't really perform I, i'm terribly shy for one um and um definitely had a lot of you know stage fright initially um so it wasn't something I was like actively trying to pursue. And in a lot of ways, it's quite challenging to perform my music because so much of it is uh, sort of captured in the details of the recordings. You know, that can be a bit challenging to, uh, especially early on, to uh, capture that. Um, luckily, the more modern sort of technology makes that a lot easier. But um, yeah. Even modern a technology, of like, what program back to when you were starting to make music on your own computer like what program were you using when you started versus what program do you use now like was it fruity loops before and now it's like ableton like what programs are you using to make wow music? you actually nailed it the first um the first program i used was fruity loops which uh um, i'm pretty sure was like a freeware thing you know you mm -hmm. just download it for free and um it's quite restrict it was quite restrictive in the way that you kind of put stuff together which you know made a lot of sense for like uh dance music or you know hip-hop or whatever it's like very program style stuff worked really well um it's loop heavy yeah loop heavy so like i worked with that for maybe a year or so and a friend turned me on to a program called reason um which uh it's uh it's a they kind of try to model it's you know it's a virtual program but they model like real pieces of gear so like there's actually a mixing board in the way that you would Whoa. see like, uh and um so that was you know a bit more flexible i used that for a number of years and then yeah around the time i started performing ableton was um you know recommended heavily and how easy it is to sort of and tracks and stuff like that yeah to sort of for performers especially you know you can kind of manipulate it and in a lot of different ways and um yeah i haven't i've been using that you know for probably 
12 do years or something. With, do you start with um, analog synths or at this point, are you using presets at all? Are you, do you, cause, cause I remember watching a video of you several years ago, maybe, maybe 10, 12 years ago of you like playing different synthesizers mm -hmm. and trying, like, um, so are you analog? Or are you presets? What, what's your, what's your flow right now? Yeah, early in my career, I was um, using a lot more kind of vintage gear, uh, like vintage synths and stuff, um, mainly because the, again, the technology hadn't reached a place where um, it sounded good enough, you know, particularly for the style. I was going for like a very kind of um, throwback sound at the time. Um, so the best way to capture that was to actually use the real thing. Um, I actually sold pretty much all of my gear when I moved, before I moved here. Um, what do you have and, left? Uh, um, mainly, I pretty much do everything in the computer these days um, with emulations of some of these old gear. Uh, I still have a couple of synths. There's like a Moog. Um, that I use for bass. It's like a monophonic synth. And then, um, you know, I have like acoustic instruments, you know, that are quite hard to replicate. Um, but as far as synthesizers and, you know, I use a lot of samples and stuff as well, but, um, yeah, it's just, I don't, I can't hear a difference now between the hardware version of things and the software and, uh, just the ease of use and, uh, being able to like, save and recall something in a matter of seconds versus you know i've worked in hardware studios that does everything with hardware and it's like yeah. to go backwards in time and make an adjustment you have to like you know go and turn the knobs exactly how they were you know when you did the session which is kind of a nightmare um so uh yeah no looking back for me and it, i mean yeah. obviously it makes the live show much easier because you know, we don't have to travel with this vintage equipment that can break down at any moment. It's all kind of coming off the computer. I would assume that stuff is made quick, quicker now, like, um, you know, within or without, like that must have taken a lot longer than what you're making now. Yeah, I mean, I was talking about this with a, a friend who's a musician, um, just about how many hoops I had to jump through to get some of the the tricks you know i was kind of talking about a lot of the vibe of watched out is sort of it's kind of built into the, the recordings um and for instance like early in my career i was really interested in like um like it, the music sounding like an old cassette tape or something um which at the time the only way to really do that was to actually bounce the song to a cassette or something like that you know maybe there are a handful of plugins that you could really abuse uh and use you know really as it's intended to sort of start to get that kind of sound but um nowadays there's like any number of plugins that can replicate that sound uh quickly and easily and um so uh yeah it's it's um you know i, I still try to you know, find things and use things, you know, maybe not in the way that they're intended because you can sort of stumble into interesting results. But yeah, most of that is happening sort of in the computer now versus there are a lot of like tricks I was doing with cassettes and just tape in general. Right. What did yeah. you do to get rid of stage fright? Uh, just playing hundreds of shows. Um, I would say the first, uh, probably 50 or 60 shows was just complete like deer and headlights moment of like almost like blacking out and and you know just like going through the motions and you know obviously doing the best i can but not really super present or like having um you were just getting uh, through it. yeah and just like i wasn't experienced enough to like know what to ask for to feel more comfortable in terms of like what i was hearing or um so yeah it was mainly just um a lots of practice and um yeah there reaches a point where um and actually it's to be honest it's much easier with bigger shows uh with bigger crowds because 
um, which might be counterintuitive, but the crowd's more anonymous that way. Yeah, exactly. So versus like you play a tiny club and like there's literally someone staring you in the face like two feet away, um, which is uh, can be a bit intense. But um, yeah, I've gotten over that now, and I mean, I, I still get maybe uh, a little nervous from time to time, but um, I guess I'm just more experienced and maybe just um, maybe don't care as much. <laughs> At all, you enjoy performing more than you used to. What's that? Do you enjoy performing? It's not as much of a chore? Yeah, I mean, there's times where I do. I mean, the problem with our show is that it's quite uh, technical in the way things are set up. Um, so especially early in tours, there's like lots of things that are being fixed on the fly and like a lot of things that can go wrong, unfortunately. So I'm always like, that's in the back of my mind. So once we... Uh, finally get things uh figured out and everything's working properly I, I definitely can kind of start to get lost in the music a little bit uh which that's really great um i certainly love traveling um you know and the the parts of the process in between shows you know just get, being able to explore cities and stuff and i like djing which i do quite a bit in between albums um that's just nice because it's completely on the fly um, where the washed out band shows like every second is, is pretty much like been planned and thought right. about. Um, so it's like a Vegas show. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I've, I figured out like, you know, there's some bands that, you know, like they show up and they plug in their instruments and they start playing um, again to sort of capture what the washed out sound is it has to that pre-production is pretty necessary um and i try to just structure it like it's structured in the recording session in a lot of ways so that takes a lot of kind of planning um yeah i felt like for the first probably five years of the band we were approaching it like that where you know we just plug in and we like rock out or whatever and uh, we just sadly i feel like uh looking back it was kind of like we were like a washed out cover band, you know, mm. like, you know, just we're playing the songs, but they're, yeah. they're not really represented in a way that, you know, made a lot of sense. and was like true to the album sound. Yeah. Um, now, of, of course, you know, you gained a lot of, you know, a lot of, of uh, fans from Field All Around. Um, how soon after Portlandia premiered and that was the title theme, did your life change? Or did it change at all? It definitely changed. Um, yeah, I mean, there was already a lot of like sort of buzz online. Um, back then, there was a very sort of robust um, sort of blog scene, I guess you would say. Yeah, you know, there were favorite. I remember. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So there was, you know, stuff like Pitchfork that was very influential, but then there are these smaller websites that um were kind of i think of it it's almost like the minor leagues like baseball or whatever where like you know the pitchforks of the world would basically follow these let the, these smaller blogs do like the core like a and r work and then they would swoop in and pick cherry pick you know like what they feel like was the best accurate yeah um, yeah there you go yeah that's the same works the same way now i guess but mm -hmm. Yeah, Pitchfork probably has much less influence, and it's you know that A and R stuff is probably happening more on TikTok. But but uh, yeah, I mean there was already a lot of buzz, and like I did like a tour like around South by Southwest, which was um, just really exciting because we, we we played like twelve shows in a matter of like three or four days, and you know there were a lot of label interest, and the Portlandia thing came a little bit later, and yeah, that sort of maybe. Uh, pushed it into uh, even more into a spotlight or something. Um, but it was a, for sure like a dramatic shift. I mean, I was, I had graduated from college and was like, uh, it was during the recession and I was having a really hard time finding a job and I was living with my parents actually. And then all of a sudden I'm like on tour for like three months, four months straight. Um, uh, so yeah, that was quite a change. Did you did you license? Did your did you personally have anything to do with the, with that placement, or was that 
record company stuff? Well, there was no record company at the time. So yeah, it was just me. And I didn't even have a manager for like maybe three years into my stuff being a thing. So luckily I had, I was introduced to like a music business lawyer who um, was in New York and knew a bunch of people. And it was actually through him. I think he had a mutual friend with uh, Fred Armisen and um, he gave uh, Fred my email and it was like, you know, he just hit me up on Gmail. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, at the time it was like fairly uh, straight ahead and simple. It was just like, yeah, I'm, basically the way he described it, it was like sort of a passion project that, you know, they only intended to do it for, you know, just a handful of episodes and then he was going to move on and do something else. And then it was kind of a surprise to everyone that it was uh, a success and that people were into it. And I mean, I forget how many seasons they ended up doing, but um Creator. Yeah, but at the time, you know, I mean, he, he certainly paid me, but it was like I would have given it to them for free. You know, I literally had nothing going on and no one in my ear being like, oh, you should ask for this or that, you know. So, um, but it certainly paid off in terms of exposure and, you know, still have people coming up, even though the show is, you know, uh, has been active for a number of years. You know, people like still discover my music through reruns of the show. Now your your sound you you mentioned uh, uh, Toro and Moi you mis- mentioned Chaz you guys are considered like the the leaders in the chill wave thing did you, are you, were you one of those people who kind of rejected labels don't don't call me chill wave don't call me lo-fi or did you kind of like that was it kind of exciting to be part of a movement to be well I'm using air quotes like like nothing like rat all over the place here yeah but, yeah no it was um, it was never something I. You know, I was a little concerned that maybe that would pigeonhole uh, my music in a in a way. But at the same time, it, it I liked all of the I was fans of most of the bands that you know I was grouped with, and it certainly sort of set us apart. Um, and there's definitely similarities in terms of like influences and just taste, and it had so much to do with just being at the right place at the right time. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say maybe like uh, I question whether or not my music is still chill wave. I have no idea. You know, I just sort of like follow what's interesting, um, you know, at, for me at the time and how that sort of fits into my music. I think my main challenge is like, you know, I never want to make the same album twice. Um, I'm always wanting to sort of change things up in some way, but also I'm, I'm not interested in just completely reinventing myself. You know, I, I want there to be some through line. So, uh, whether that has anything to do with, with what chill wave means now, I have no idea, but, um, I imagine just, you know, for, for the sake of me, you know, I have a taste, certain taste in the sound and it probably comes through regardless of the specific project. I'm curious about your process of like making an album. Um, I've heard before that kind of like albums make themselves where let's say you have a period of time where you're making music and they could, you find a common theme and then you say, okay, this is a group, this is an album. Sure. Um, what's your process in making an album? Yeah, I think I've made enough albums finally where I do have a process. I mean, I think the first couple of albums, I was a bit lost in the dark um, and it maybe took longer. Uh, I think for me, I, I could compare it to like a, a painter and like, uh, you know, a painter might have like a palette of colors, for instance, um, and using those same color palette can sort of shape a body of work in a certain way. And so for me, early in the process, it's just try experimenting and trying a bunch of things and trying to figure out what the palette of sounds are going to be. It's going to sort of shape the look and the feel. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes that happens really quickly, you know, like a couple months and other times it takes a year, you know, just kind of like, and I would say it's generally harder the more albums I make because, you know, I've I've covered a lot of ground, you know, so it's sometimes harder to find, to break new ground, but um, yeah, it's figuring out the sounds first and then, you know, just through making tons and tons of demos, you know, 
you stumble upon something that makes sense. I mean, it's always for me, at least it's like, there's one song that's sort of like an aha moment or like a key that unlocks sort of what makes sense. Um, there was definitely a song like that for this new album. And I would say that's actually the hardest thing. And I'm always really curious to know people's process and like, particularly with something like a filmmaker, just because making films, it takes such a long time. You know, you're committing like three, four, five years, you know, on this one project. So just that understanding of like, how do you settle on this project being worthy of that, you know? And so uh, I struggle with that. Um, just, uh, you know, I'm, I finally maybe will write a song that feels, uh, just checks all the boxes I'm looking for, but then you're just kind of committing to like, all right, I guess this is, this is what like the next chapter is going to be. Uh, and that takes, you know, a bit of a leap of faith, I guess. Now uh, you mentioned, you mentioned filmmaking. Um, your music is so cinematic. Have you ever been approached to do a soundtrack or have you had any interest in scoring a film? Yeah, I've done a couple of projects. There was a small, like a short documentary, um, that uh, I did for Levi's. It was like a, um, telling talking about like the history of the brand um and then maybe a couple of much shorter things i would say it's quite challenging mainly because uh, i've just been like you know pretty much like a pop songwriter for my career so i kind of think about making music in that very strict kind of format um three to four tracks yeah, yeah yeah and oftentimes you know depending on the director and depending on what they're looking for, you know, it can, it can be a bit more free flowing than that. Um, and, uh, which, which was a challenge for me. I, you know, I know some musicians like myself who are mainly songwriters, like we'll just make a bunch of work. And then, you know, as is, they'll just place that music in where this director wanted things to be like sort of hitting marks and stuff, which was quite challenging. Oh my God. Um, that's more like the Hans Zimmer style where you're like right. really yeah, setting I was tone. doing kind of like a Trent Reznor kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I was, and it, also you're serving someone else's vision, which is quite sure, different. Sure. And just the number of rewrites, you know, there was a fairly short schedule and like just the deadlines and stuff were, you know, normally I don't really work with deadlines. So I was having to like make yeah. a ton of work every day. Like non Hollywood that you know that that those two worlds wouldn't mix well for you i feel like yeah yeah but at the same time i'm like very interested in that way of working at the same time um less on the deadline side of like really kind of strict parameters but more just writing music that's a bit like i i make a lot of like ambient music and stuff that isn't necessarily like commercial um and so i feel like that style of music can while it doesn't work so well with like for most people at least you know on spotify or whatever when it's paired with like a beautiful image it can uh it can really work in an interesting way so um yeah if there's any filmmakers watching this please hit me up a quick story i i i moved i moved out and i'm we're about the same age i moved to this big loft when within and without came out and i remember just pumping it up in these 20 foot ceilings and just letting it fill the room. So, uh, you know, that's what I always think of is just like the openness and the expansion and layers of your sound. So that's what I appreciate. Oh, it, very cool. Yeah. I appreciate that. Like pumped into a loft. I can attest to that. <laughs> nice. Very I feel cool. like you're one of the more like mysterious kind of artists. And like, I'm actually curious, like, what does your day look like from the moment you wake up to like, do you have a structure you go to bed yeah like what does washed out day look like um yeah i mean I, I it's it is pretty structured i'd say and um mainly you know i have i have a family i have uh three young kids and so there is a certain sort of lifestyle stuff built into you know i get up quite early you know they drop them off at school some days, uh, definitely like making meals and and changing diapers and stuff like that. Um, 
but yeah, but I mean, because of that, I've, I've, I mean, this has been for years now, you know, I, I pretty much work like nine to five. I show up here every day. You know, I don't necessarily work on music every day, but, um, you know, I, I know that some creative people like feel like they have to be like inspired to make work. And, um, I'm sort of, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm not inspired, but I just kind of just make stuff all the time. Um, you know, and generally that produces results over like a long period of time, a long enough period of time, I guess. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I kind of alluded in terms of lifestyle, I kind of allude, that's sort of what the album title is about that. Like, um, I live a pretty simple life by choice. Um, mainly so I can have time to like focus on the stuff that I want to focus on, you know, which a major chunk of that is creativity and music for sure. So like from nine to five, I'm like, you know, I turn my phone off and, you know, try not to go down YouTube rabbit holes or whatever, and just focus on making stuff. Um, uh, after that, you know, it's mainly like family, like I said, um, and, uh, pretty much that's it i mean obviously days where i'm like touring or traveling that's like you know they're quite structured as well but you're just like moving around and sound checks and and that sort of thing but yeah i i live a really really simple lifestyle which um um i prefer at this point we'll let you out here in a second ernest last big thing i want to ask is do you have a favorite synthesizer or synthesizer sound Hmm. I mean, that changes a little bit, I guess. Like, I think uh, each album, there's normally like one instrument or one group of instruments that sort of, um, again, you know, using that metaphor of like the palette of colors, you know. Um, for this one was the software synthesizer called Pigments. Um, it's quite modern sounding. Um, and you can do uh, lots of different things with it, but I, I think I used it more than any other sound, like, you know, instrument. Um, but in, in terms of like, just the sound that I'll always love, there's a, a vintage synthesizer that was made in the eighties called a Juno 106 that, uh, you know, is on hundreds of records. Um, it's really simple to use, um, but it just has a sound that, I mean, very much is like tied to the 80s, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, that one's probably my, my my all time favorite. Okay, that's what that's what we wanted. That's what like the takeaway we wanted that. The, what, what's her favorite synth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. All right. Well, we'll let you go. Thank you so much. The album is out June 28th, um, and then you got a tour coming up after that. So looking forward to to uh, to your summer. Thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. All right, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Cool. That was Ernest Green. Wow. What is hey, it? Wait, what was the guy of MySpace again? Tom, shout out Tom and shout out Juno 106. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you, Sue, so you you were a kid when MySpace was big. Did you no. want a MySpace page or did you have a MySpace page even though you were like 10 years old? I remember having MySpace like fifth grade right before high school and i was like oh my god i can't use facebook that's for like grown-ups you know like yeah so. yeah uh did, I, you have yeah. Top five? did you have a top five jordan i had certain because you could play a song remember you could embed a song on your profile that would yes. play automatically. and i remember i really like put a lot of effort into picking really cool song because i wanted people I think I was really cool when they came across my page. But Jordan, the question is, like, would I be in your top five? You'd be in my top eight. Wow! <laughs> no, here's 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 my oh space my politics. God. Here's my space politics with your top eight. Um, I had to have my girlfriend in there at the time, mm -hmm. um, and then a couple other like art people and then i had to have a, it was a kind of political because i had a, i had a couple cousins that were on there and they had to stay in the top eight like you had to have certain people that had to remain in the top eight for like personal reasons because you didn't want to upset anyone i'm upset you know? yeah all right and let's check out these multicolored nails you got the, the oh my god do you like you guys 
Yeah. I'm oh, it's like black and pink. Yeah. That's kind of like Kelly vibes, you know? It's like the logo colors. I did it myself. 